Are we? Yeah. Oh, yeah, but we're supposed to be there. So he's, uh, so Andre said uh, 11.40. 11.40, so it's in the office. I think so. Yes, we will. Great. We'll continue, and then we're happy to have to leave in about 15 minutes, like that. So it's a bit early. I'm still finishing my suite. <laughs> I do apologize for the crunch. Right, so, um, so in this lecture, what I want to do is uh, I'm just going to take some of the things I was talking about and show you how we applied them to various problems. And mainly these problems that we were interested in is, uh, is various manifestations of string theory. And actually there's gonna be quite a, a, a peculiar overlap with some of the questions of the previous, uh, in the previous lecture. Um, so, uh, so this is a layout of what I'm gonna talk about. So I'm, I'm gonna talk, just give you an introduction about the first attempts that we made to look at genetic algorithms in string theory and the reason to talk about those even though they're, they're kind of uh, I don't know, simpler models is that those models are more or less the well the, the earliest ones that we think you can apply quantum annealing to or annealing in general to so I'll, I'll show you what we did more recently with those models and uh, and annealing and and then we'll be able to start to compare how these things um, how they do on different theories. And, and then I'll talk about uh, genetic algorithms uh, in uh, heterotic line bundle models. So those models are now much, it's a much larger search space. So then we can start to see you know, how, how they operate in search spaces, which can be huge. Um, and then I'll talk about how they compare with reinforcement learning. So this is this kind of, uh, you know, um, nice overlap with what was discussed in the previous lecture. So, we're, so we can compare genetic algorithms and reinforcement learning, and we can kind of continue that conversation if you like. And if I have time, I'm not sure I'll have time, but then I'll talk, uh, if I do, I'll talk about our recent uh, ideas about combining quantum annealing or simulated annealing and genetic algorithms. It's a, yeah, so quantum annealing and genetic algorithms. So a genetic algorithmic form of quantum annealing. Um, right, okay, so before I start, I'm just going to sort of give credit to people who worked on genetic algorithms in particle physics. So I wasn't the first, but I was probably, possibly the first to be aware of it the, uh, because I was the PhD examiner of David Grelscheidt in 2004, which is where I first saw that. So, so that was one of the earlier papers with Fernando Proveda. And then, um, and then there was various work. We see it's not really been... Uh, so popular if I compare it to other, like machine learning papers, for example, there's far more of those. Quantum annealing is even fewer, so I don't need to give you references for that because that pretty much everything I'm going to talk about is, is what we did, essentially. No, or not many people have done stuff on that. Right, okay. So let me talk about um, our first efforts on building string theories with genetic algorithms. So. Uh, this, is a, this is really the first attempt that people made to construct a string theory from first principles. And, uh, and the models we looked at are probably the most, uh, I don't know what you call it, uh, sort of binary construction of string models that you can imagine. So there's something called the fermionic string construction, which is uh, built from, uh, so it's a CFT of the right uh, weight, and you build it from fermionic degrees of freedom, and then your degrees of freedom in the fermions, which define your model, are basically the phases that these fermions can take as you go around uh, what, say, one loop diagram, uh, for, uh, which you would look at for consistency. So that's where your GSO projections come from. So that's a very old construction. And we were looking for, uh, something which is similar to the standard model. So uh, we, we focus on patty salar models, which are a, a SU2 cross SU2 structure. So they're very similar to standard model and the standard model can come out of them. And there were there's some construction which uh, I, uh, which was developed by John Rizzo amongst other people. So he was the one that I met and we decided we should have a look at this with genetic algorithms. 
Right, okay, so then what we're interested in is these phases on fermions, and eventually everything boils down to a huge matrix of ones and zeros in these models. And it turns out there are 51 uh, degrees of freedom left after you've satisfied the sort of trivial one. So you've got 51 choices of ones and zeros. So it's two to the 51, and, and so it's uh, 10 to the 15 or so, the parameter space. So relatively small <laughs> compared, to, uh, compared to the things I'll talk about later. Anyway, so this is what you can ask for. And, and this is how we set up our genetic algorithm. So, so now remember, we have to find a fitness function. Define a fitness function. And, and as you hopefully remember, the fitness function can be essentially whatever my desires are. So I am going to ask for three uh, generations of, uh, of chiral states. Uh, I'm going to require the existence of Patti Salam breaking Higgs because I want to get the standard model eventually, a standard model Higgs doublet for more than one, one or more. And then um, I want to have absence of fractionally charged states, so stuff that I don't want. And I also want to ask for a top Yukawa coupling. So those are my sort of minimal phenomenology requirements. So I, I, I put them A to E. And of course, as I apply more of them, there are fewer models that fit. So, uh, so if I ask for the first three conditions, I've got one in 10,000. The first four will be one in two and a half million. And if I ask for everything, it's one in 10, uh, 10 billion models in the parameter space. And, and so it's interesting to take those different conditions and see is the genetic algorithm actually helpful or not. So let's, let's have a look. So, so our but what we're thinking is that, you know, if I was to just be doing a random scan, I would have to construct 10 billion models in order to find one of these perfect ones. And, and so that's what I'm comparing to is how, how few models do I need to build in order to find one that I want. Uh, and this is, this is how it looks. So what I'm showing you is on the, on the y-axis, number of models I have to make versus uh, the, this is the mutation probability. And so you see that uh, if I ask for everything, so these, this is the yellow line, uh, A to E, those things, it's one in 10 to the 10, roughly, uh, or 10 to the nine, oh no, 10 to the 10, it's one in 10 to the 10, and as my mutation probability is about 1%, you see that I'm actually only having to make 100,000 models in order to find one of the perfect ones. So, so that's how I can tell that the genetic algorithm is working properly. And, you know, as I increase the mutation probability um, to large values, I'm, this is going to go up to 10 to the 10. So it's just basically I have to make 10 billion in order to find one, which is the random value. So the interesting thing that you notice, though, is that the genetic algorithm doesn't, and this is something to bear in mind for later, it doesn't help if it's too easy. Right, so if, if I only ask for A, B, and C, actually I may as well not bother with a genetic algorithm at all. I may as well just be doing a random scan because it doesn't, doesn't help me if it's too easy. Um, and uh, you know, it sort of, and it gets, as, as it gets more and more difficult, so it's more and more difficult, the genetic algorithm is more and more effective. So that's, those are the three points. They, they work best when they're, and also they work best when there are a lot of different criteria, which individually may be relatively easy, but the, when I put them all together, the probability of finding it is very hard. So it, that's another, uh, another thing to bear in mind. Uh, which is kind of what we're trying to do with the standard model, you know. Standard model has lots of different criteria, numbers of generations, gauge group, and so on. Basically, the problem is that we're too fussy and we want to apply 10, 15 different requirements. And so that's where a genetic algorithm is actually quite good. Right. So now I'm going to show you how you would try and do the same thing and how we try to do the same thing with quantum annealing. So with quantum annealing, um, it's, as you get the idea, we're, we're basically all about the business of solving Diophantine equations. So just as a kind of warm up, I'll just show you what happens with solving anomaly cancellation conditions. And these are gonna be similar to the sorts of things we have to look at. So there's a whole bunch of 
equations for anomaly cancellation, most of them you can reduce to, so this is so what I'm thinking of in this particular case, I'm thinking of taking the standard model, uh, the states I'm calling U, D, Q, and so on, um, and I'm extending it, the gauge group, by a U1, and I want to make sure that this U1 is anomaly free. So that's my, this is my set of anomaly equations for that equation, so that, for, for that theory. So the standard model extended by a U1 has this set of anomaly cancellation conditions. So it's kind of similar thing. It's an awful lot of Diophantine equations that I have to solve all at the same time. And, uh, and I want to solve it for reasonable fractional charges. So in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I basically multiply everything by a large integer. And so I'm looking for integer solutions to these equations you know, because the denominators I'm going to take as a large integer and just multiply everything out by that. It's all homogeneous is what I'm trying to say. Right, okay, so um, this is what you get if you do uh, that our procedure that I showed you in the last lecture. So you, you basically take those equations, put them into a loss function, you encode all of the charges, the, those u's, d's, q's, so all of those u1 charges, you encode them in a binary way. And I have a loss function, which is a square of those equations. And if it's not quadratic, I do a reduction and so on. So for example, these equations at the end, in particular the cubic, I have to do a reduction because it's a sextic when I square it. And uh, same with this quadratic, I have to reduce that. These ones are kind of nice because they can go in just as they are. So they don't require reduction, I just square them. Anyway, so this is the set of solutions. And you can see it's, it works pretty well at finding solutions to Diophantine equations. I have to, of course, limit the search space because otherwise, <laughs> as we know, it's, uh, it, it's undecidable. Uh, whether I can actually find. So I have to limit this, the search space. And so I, we, here we're choosing plus or minus, I think 32 was the largest uh, integer that we went up to. Or was it plus 16 to minus 16? I don't remember. Anyway. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. That's right. There were some subtleties about how we move around in the search space. But anyway, in the end, the search space in principle is three times 10 to the 25. So you see, it's a pretty big search space. And the reason it's, it's quite so big is because there's an awful lot of numbers in this, uh, in this table. An awful lot of, uh, of, of uh, things are going into our Diophantine equations. So that's the sort of situation in which actually both techniques are pretty good, genetic algorithms and quantum annealing. Right, okay, so now let me return to the string model again. So, so, it, so this is, I'm just sort of reminding you, that this is the same model. It's built out of a set of, uh, of phases which depend, which tell you how the fermions are allowed to get, um, are, are allowed to behave as I go around the one loop diagram. And uh, in this, for this particular case, we're not able to go all the way down to Patti Salam. So we had to just make do with an SO10 gauge group in the end. So you see, we're already a little bit restricted in what we can do. So we have a smaller set of basis vectors that we're playing with slightly. Um, and then your GSO constraints, so what the equations you're having to solve are essentially involving those phases, the phases on the states that you can have in some Diophantine equation, which is like the one at the top. So the I's label T2 planes in this construction. So it doesn't doesn't really matter, but anyway, the I's label the, the three T2 planes. The deltas are matrices which include these particular, well, dot products of phases. So if I write A, uh, A slash B, it means E to the I pi A dot B. And A dot B is, in principle, it's Lorentzian, but it doesn't really matter because it's zeros or ones. Right, okay, and then, uh, and then on the right hand side, you've also got these phases and the U's tell you what your sector is that the state is going to appear in. So we kind of simplify, we have to start simplifying things a bit. Uh, in order to solve it, reduction would make this too difficult. So what we decided to do was we decided we were gonna choose which sectors the states appeared in that we were interested in. So we choose our PQRS. So we're actually solving equations which are linear. 
I mean, that's already complicated enough. We're, we're solving a whole load of linear equations with all of these different possible phases in it. So that was the way we sort of tackled that. If we didn't do that, we wouldn't have been able to fit it on the machine, basically. Reduction would have made the problem too difficult. Um, and in addition, so now we have to start applying things like the number of states that we've got. And, uh, and so we, we want to have three generations. So this is another basically Diophantine condition on phases. And we arrange things. So there's a, this, which is, this thing, which is essentially three contributions, reduces down to one and so on. So we have to start making choices in order to, uh, in order to make this thing feasible. But anyway, um, it's still relatively complicated. And so now we can compare the different sorts of approach. So this is what we found. And um, on this, on the x-axis now, I'm showing you machine time and I'm comparing this setup, uh, solving it with a random scan genetic algorithm, simulated annealing, quantum annealing, and this, is, this would be perfect quantum annealing, which I'll talk about in a minute. So the thing to notice though, is that, if, so this is the, the green line is the genetic algorithm and the red line is the random scan. And you see that the annealing in principle for this type of problem is like order of magnitudes faster than that. So it can be in principle very fast. The thing that you have to bear in mind though, is that if you, the, number, the number of models that we're looking for in our search space, is something like one in 10 to the five. So this is probably a situation that we, where it's relatively easy. So the GA is not gonna be that much of a benefit compared to just a random scan. If we had a problem which was way harder, I think that the genetic algorithm would start to, uh, you know, start to increase and start to improve and come close to annealing. But the point is that the annealing methods are, in, are very fast for a problem which is not so hard, you know, so some at one in 10 to the five or something. It can, uh, it can really be much faster. Uh, right, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, so I don't really, I don't have a particular reason why they should be similar to each other, actually. I mean, it's not obvious that they should operate in, in exactly the same way. So the simulated annealing is not just simulating the quantum annealer. Oh, no, no. The simulated annealing is actually simulated annealing. So it's like a metropolis algorithm. So there's a temperature and so on. The quantum annealing, and I'll tell you why it's a, do, it's a dashed line. What the, the, the reason that this is, we, we write this as machine time, is that when you're accessing the annealer, there's a delay of about a second or something in, to put the thing onto the annealer and get the information off the annealer. So you can't run it in physical time at the same speed as you can for the simulated annealing. So simulated annealing is actually time on my laptop, you know, so that is, I'm comparing time in seconds on my laptop with different methods. The dashed line is time on the annealer if they were kind enough to let me have access to the, to the annealer and no one else, in which case uh, then, it would, then it would be kind of instantaneous to put the thing off and on, uh, on and off. But uh, there's a kind of delay. Yeah. yeah, so so the the lines I'm showing are really the time that it spent on the annealer getting solved, not the time it took me to send it to Canada or whatever. Okay, so this is just something to bear in mind. The, the pluses of quantum annealing and simulated annealing, it can be very fast. The minuses are that you have to encode the problem on the annealer. So it means that you're gonna to have to make choices and you're gonna to have to, if, you're, if your theory is difficult, then it's gonna be hard to uh, encode it. So for example, one thing which is hard to encode is the requirement of three generations. Right? So I have to count the number of times I solve these equations somehow. And I, it means I have to encode that number. I need a counting, a way of counting in my, uh, quantum annealer. So encoding that is kind of hard to do. You need to sort of set up some qubits which will count. Uh, and then, you, you know, that, that number minus three squared is going to be another contribution to the loss function. So yeah, that's the, that's the downside. The plus side is it can be very fast. So it's something to bear in mind, really. I mean, quantum computers are coming. 
in various sorts. So it's worth bearing this sort of construction in mind. You could also be put the same thing on a gate quantum computer, say so. When those are coming, you can think of uh, using these sorts of techniques. Okay, so that was all I wanted to say about that. Now let me talk about Calabrieros a bit. Are there any questions? Right, okay. So now uh, I want to talk about something which is uh, a much larger search space, which is what you get with Calabrieros. So this is now much more recent work. And actually, I'm going to talk about these things in reverse order a little bit because uh, the, the second thing I'm going to talk about, which we did first, is a comparison of, uh, of these methods, genetic algorithms with um, reinforcement learning. So it's kind of interesting to see. Anyway, so this is now the most recent thing, which is, uh, which is how genetic algorithms fare when you have a, a model which is uh, based on a Calabier, so it's a, a complete intersection Calabier, and it has line bundles on it in order to get the right sort of model so to break the gauge symmetry for, uh, for example and so on so uh, you have this sort of uh, set of pairs of things so you've got the clavier and you've got your set of line bundles and we're going to focus more on the line bundles and just take a, a fixed clavier to be working with so we considered each of these different clavieres in this particular in this particular work. So, we so these are the configuration matrices. And hopefully you know how to read these now, <laughs> if you didn't before. Um, so so it, it's, it's showing you some polynomial, some projection with some polynomials of the different variables which are appearing in the different pieces. Um, right, okay, so, and oh, also these are the uh, H11, and this is the Euler number, oh, wait a minute. Okay, that doesn't appear there. Okay, the H11s are five here, that's the important thing. Right, okay, so you have a set of integers which define your line bundle moduli, uh, your line bundles, which are these Ks, and there are five of them. And so it defines your first churn class. So that, that's what defines your, uh, your, uh, your model, essentially. We have to make an additional assumption, which is that uh, we are going to be breaking. So, so we're going to end up with something like an SU5, and that has to be further broken down to the standard model gauge group on some sort of orbifolding. And so, uh, and, and that orbifolding has, a, has some uh, dimension we're going to call gamma. So it could be like Z2 or Z4 or something. So that gamma is going to come into our equations, essentially. Right, so the nice thing about these models is that there's uh, nowadays formulae which can tell us a lot of the data, a lot of the things we need to know about them. And in particular, the spectrum is, is something which you can just figure out analytically from the Ks. Um, and so, uh, so a lot of the elements in the spectrum. So, so, and we have to satisfy various conditions, vanishing first chain class, for example, an omni cancellation. This, which is more difficult, <laughs> and uh, so poly stability conditions, and then the spectrum, and uh, and so on. So we we end up with basically a whole load of Diophantine equations, which involve these integers k, and we again we have to restrict our search space. So we're going to let k go from minus two to the n to plus two to the n, um, and we let n equal three for everyone except the last um, Calabier, which is the four oh seven one. Uh, mainly because it's got a larger H11. So it's H11 is seven, and it would get much more difficult <laughs> with that one. So if it's so the search space with it, if so the choosing the number of possible, if you look at the number of possible Ks, and there's H11 of them, uh, you, you've got four H N plus one, if we're taking from minus two to the N to two to the N. So two to the power of four H N plus one. So I get, for example, for this one, five, three, oh, two, I would get 10 to the 29. It's the search space size. But if I allow larger uh, Ks, I can, this, it can be a sort of limitlessly large search space. So it, uh, it's much huger than those other models I was showing you. Right, okay, so now this is, this is what happens with the genetic algorithm. And this was run for quite a long time. It, was a, uh, it took a, a couple of weeks or something to run. 
So this is uh, X7, is 7447, yeah. Oh, okay, this is, yeah, you're right. It's the 470, but that one takes much longer. Yeah, so this is this takes about a day, uh, but what you're seeing on the axis, on the X axis is number of genetic episodes. Each episode is, is 90,000 states that are visited. So we're still in the end, we're visiting something like 10 to the 10 states to do this. Um, However, we've, and, but we've saturated, and, and this is like the number of, basically the number of perfect models. I'll show you how many there are, it's, it's like 200 and something, but we found them all essentially when we've visited that many states. But remember the search space could be two to the 29 or something. So we're, we're, we're visiting a tiny fraction of the entire search space to do it. Yep. Um, so it's saturating. So do you know there wasn't sort of some island somewhere of other models? I, I'll, yeah, so, so when I get to the reinforcement learning, I'll come back to that point, basically, Thank because that isn't it, that's the, an interesting question. Of how do you know that? Yeah. Um, right, okay, and then this is the, this was the 4071, and this doesn't, didn't quite saturate. So this was after like a couple, but this is like 80% of the total. So... Oh, sorry, we don't know what the total is for those. Uh, yeah, the 5302 is about 80%. It depends a little bit what you're choosing for uh, your gamma, for example. Right, okay, but you can see here, this. so, so here we're, we're exploring only 10 to the minus 19 of the entire search space, and we found almost here anyway, 93% of the, of the known solution. So you've got 403. Whereas a scan will give you 444, 442. So it's, uh, it's extremely efficient, the genetic algorithm. Yeah, so this one, the 4071, it's, I mean, a, a, a scan has not been done of that, but, uh, so we're, but we've explored 10 to the minus 14, and we have a relatively large, looks like it's a relatively large proportion of the final. Oh, okay, this. So I'm plotting, so on this axis, it's the number of models that we found which satisfy all the criteria, right? And this axis is the number, it's basically time, but it's the number of models that we've actually had to construct in order to find it. Well, it's, it's the number of genetic episodes. So, so that for the number of models times this axis by 90,000, essentially. Uh, that's the number of models we've visited in order to find that number of perfect models. What you would call terminal states in reinforcement learning language. Yeah. So the thing we were looking for, essentially. So what we're looking for is that sort of shape, because at this point, you, 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 it looks as if there's no more to be found. We found them all. Yeah. So this one is not quite saturated, but it looks like it's getting there. Yeah. Right. Okay. So now, um, now let me compare that. Uh, a similar sort of model, and we're going to look at reinforcement learning and do a comparison. So um, this was actually, as I said, it was the earlier, this is the earlier work that we did. Um, and this was a monad bundle. So it's basically, it's also based on line bundles, but uh, they're sort of, they're, they're, they're the, uh, they're what you build the monad out of, the monad bundle out of. And so, so there's two line bundle sums here. B and C, and each has its own set of numbers, and uh, you put them together in a monad bundle, and it boils down to, again, a matrix of integers where K goes up to H11, again. Uh, and it, for this work, we just looked at these two collabiers. Okay. So, you know, you can do the same type of, uh, same type of estimate of how big the search space is going to be. So if you say you allow 10 entries for your K or two to the N, 10, it's, uh, 10 entries is going to be 10 to the H11 times by the, the uh, RB and RC minus one. So those are the ranks of the two line bundles. So again, you know, if H11 is three, which was one of these uh, collaborators, so this one is three, you're going to get very huge search spaces very quickly. So again, the similar sorts of sizes. Right, okay, so now uh, those sorts of models had already been looked at by Andre and uh, friends. 
So it was interesting to compare the two methods and how they behave. So now we, uh, so the, what they've done is already, they'd already looked at reinforcement learning for those models, which works pretty well. And so now I have, as tradition dictates, I'm just going to, uh, to talk, tell you what Fabian just told you a minute ago. So this is, this is the reinforcement learning as a single flow chart. So the, this is the way it works, just to remind you. Uh, you, you have something, a policy, which is supposed to be telling you which direction you're going to go in your search space, essentially. Your output of that, you, you feed into an environment and you decide is it a good outcome or a bad outcome. And then, uh, depending on that, you have a reward which goes back into your neural network here, which is determining your policy. And at the same time, you'll make yourself a new state. So, you know, your, your new state is going back here, gets acted upon and present uh, and produces another state, which then goes to your environment again. So it goes around like that. All right, so this works for these sorts of models. And the code that you use is reinforced, it's Mathematica code. Um, and this is the sort of thing that happens. So for a particular, yeah, so this is for the, uh, for the bicubic. You have a, you choose a range for your B and C. And so your B, uh, for this one, it's, between, it's a range of seven from minus three to four, or eight, sorry, minus three to four and zero to seven. So the search space is about 10 to the 12-ish. So it's still relatively small, but anyway, this is what happens. Uh, essentially, there's like a long training period, relatively long training period, and at some point, the reinforcement uh, the reinforcement learning, the network gets the idea. And so you then start to find terminal states very quickly. And then you, you then it's trained at that point. So at that point, it should be, you know, if you if you come again tomorrow, that's good, it should find terminal states pretty quickly. So this was a genetic algorithm on the same sorts of models. And here I'm showing you the number of states that you have to visit in order to find. Uh, the term, this is the terminal fraction, so it's a number of terminal states that you're getting. Um, and the genetic algorithm is much faster to find the first solutions. So here, this is only after 100 generations. Population has 250 in it, roughly. Um, and so you're doing something like 20,000 to find a model. So, you know, this, this increase here is happening something around there. So it seems to work much quicker to find the first solutions to genetic algorithm. And that was generally what we found, that it somehow it would, it would uh, the training period, you can think of training the population, if you like, when you're doing a genetic. So you had sort of training the population on this problem. It finds solutions quite a bit quicker than a uh, reinforcement learning does. So um, it, to compare them, so this was, uh, this is a comparison about redundancy. So, what, so whether they're producing the same model or not. Uh, and what you tend to find is that, uh, so this is another aspect of genetic algorithms, because of the way they work, they tend to produce redundancy. So you tend to get a lot of copies of the same model and you have to kind of try and force it away to a completely different area of parameter space. And the same isn't really true of reinforcement learning, or it's true to a lesser extent you get this kind of redundancy. However, so if you're just comparing uh, saturation, you do see saturation also happens relatively quick in a genetic algorithm. But again, you know, you have to bear in mind, there may be more redundancy in the population. So yeah, comparing times, it, it was one core day versus 35 core days for reinforcement learning. So you see it's something like uh, you know, orders of magnitude faster. However, it doesn't find all of the perfect states that the reinforcement learning does so quickly. So to find the last few states with a genetic algorithm, you know, you have to do a bit more work to find the last ones that are hiding there. Reinforcement learning is somehow a little bit less redundant. So yeah, they behave in quite a different way. Um, and then this is, this is now getting back to your question about uh, how do I know how do I know that I, I'm finding them all? So this we contend 
having the two methods is a way to see that you're actually finding everything in a landscape. So, you know, if the landscape is very big, the search space is very big, I am not physically able to examine the whole search space. But if I have these two methods and I compare the number of state, the states from each one, when they completely overlap, I've got a good, uh, it, it, it's a good indication that we found everything. Right? So because they behave differently. So what you can do, let's see, just get rid of that. What you can do is something like a, a nonlinear map or a salmon map, as it's called, where I kind of project it down. I project the models we've found to a, to a, a two-dimensional two sheet. And so, you know, you, you have some sort of scatter plot. And the idea is that with a nonlinear map, that the distance between the points is supposed to represent as closely as possible the distance between the point, the actual distance between the points in the Hamming space. So that's a, what a nonlinear map does. You project it down to a lower dimensional space. And when, you, when we start with the two things, and we didn't actually put this in the paper, but uh, when we, you start with the two things, you get two, you get two different regions which are being occupied generally. I mean, there's some overlap, you know, there'll be some overlap, but they start, uh, occupying two different regions. So they're finding different sorts of models to start with. And then eventually they'll overlap quite closely. And so they'll, they'll, in the end they overlap. So you, you have a good idea that because they're approaching it from a different direction, but they end up with the same set of models that they, they've pretty much saturated everything in the search space. That was the idea. Right. Okay, so we think that's an important observation and, and, and it's an important reason to be combining these techniques. I don't think this is something that's done so often in the literature and for these sorts of things where you're, where you're looking to know whether you found all the solutions or not, which is maybe this is unique to physicists, I don't know, it's, uh, it's something which is, is useful for us. Right, so now this is a more difficult search. So H11 is three, it's a bigger search, space. So this is 10 to the 19. Uh, and again, it does, yeah, so it, um, the genetic algorithm does run pretty fast already. So you said, so generation you know, 300, it's already finding terminal states. So yeah, that's, that's that. Are there any questions about that? Yeah. Is is there any intuition why the genetic algorithms and reinforcement learning methods are searching different parts of this space? You're oh, oh, why they, yeah, why they start Yeah, searching. naively I would have thought there would be big overlap from the start. Yeah, uh, so uh, no is a, is a short answer. We, we wondered why, but we weren't really able to come up with a reason why. Yeah, but it, it wasn't, um, I mean, it was reproducible, you know, well, it wasn't like it was just one of them. It was, it was, you know, if you, if you do it again, you would, you know, they would have started in different regions. I think there was, uh, yeah, so the, the, you probably can remember better than I can. There, there was kind of a rough idea we had. So um, if, you, if you're considering reinforcement learning, because it's always going to have to travel in a path um, from wherever you start, wherever your, um, wherever your agent starts and then try and get to a terminal state. So if you imagine that you had some kind of clustering of terminal states, the chance of getting the interior of that cluster is going to be quite rare because the individual is going to come, if it's been trained correctly and it just walks to the bet, to the nearest terminal state to where you started off with, if you have some cluster of several things nearby, it's always going to enter from the outside. So unless you just so happen to start with the agent in that central point, then yeah, you're unlikely to find those ones. That was one reason we thought maybe uh, you could yeah. Yeah, make a difference. Uh, I've got a question on a few slides back. You had the plots comparing the fraction of terminal states for reinforcement learning and genetic algorithms. Oh, right, that one. Yeah. Yeah. Can you just explain what a round is in your reinforcement learning? Is that looking at one particular individual oh. at a time? Um, I think a round is, that's, is that not just one? Right. RL? Or? Yeah. Uh, so in RL, it's just an episode of, yeah. Well, yeah. Of within reinforcement learning. So you place the agent somewhere randomly in the space, you let it do 32 or 64 steps or whatever, and mm -hmm. you see where it ends up, and that's the, the round. 
In which case, how are you able to compare reinforcement learning to genetic algorithms? Because surely in genetic algorithms, you're considering a whole population of individuals. Mm. Say you have your population is like a size 100. Yeah. Generation, every single step will be like 100 individuals, whereas right. reinforcement learning is just one at a time. I mean, I, I think the thing to compare is the number of times you have to <laughs> construct a single model. Yeah, because uh, if I, because there's, there's a kind of optimum, there's, an, there's a formula for the optimum population number. I didn't show it you because I actually think it's quite a useless formula. But what what it, what I do know is that if you change the population, it does affect depending on the problem how well it's going to operate. Um, and yeah, so, so this is like iterations of your model. Then. Yeah, yeah. So it probably would have worked with a hundred, but it may have been you know an awful lot slower with a hundred in the population. So there's a kind of mm -hmm. optimum population as well. Okay. Yeah, but I think the the thing that you should you should be thinking about is how many times do I have to make a model to find the one I want? Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned about like combining reinforcement with genetics. Is there any way to, for example, make the policy learn how to change the mutation rate That's or it. something? Oh, okay. Something like that, yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's something that I mean, people do. People do do that to try and you mean to try and optimize the genetic algorithm, the mutation rate. So yeah, yeah. So you can do that. Um, I mean, in this sort of problem, it's not uh, it probably isn't worth setting it up because you can kind of you can sort of do it by hand. So. Okay, right then. Okay, so I'm just going to finish by um, just talking about, I'll probably finish a bit early, maybe. Uh, I'm just going to talk about something we were thinking about more recently, which is to combine, try and get the benefits of genetic algorithms and quantum annealing in one go. So, so this is what we call genetic quantum annealing. And this is, uh, and I'll, let me just show you how it works. So it's something that you might, may want to think about or something similar, is to try and combine the best of both worlds. Um, and so this is one way we came up with, with trying to do it. And so uh, I'm going to go back to this. So this is my flowchart for, uh, for, quant uh, for genetic algorithms, just to remind you. So if you, just to remind you what's going on, you have a genotype, you choose pairs, you have a crossover, there's a new set of genotypes, then you have a mutation. You have your new genotypes and then you go around here you get your phenotypes you you compare it with the environment and I, i'm kind of using deliberately reinforcement learning language so calling it an environment and then you work out the fitness and it goes back into ranking and so on so you have that and meanwhile the genotypes sort of go around the top so there's a way that you can try and take advantage of quantum annealing uh, by keeping a similar sort of flow chart but putting quantum annealing into the flowchart somewhere. So in order to do it, what, we, what you can do is you can redefine what you mean by an individual by taking, instead of ones and minus ones or ones and zeros, you, an individual is defined by the biases, by the H uh, couplings in the Ising model on the quantum annealer. So that's gonna define a single individual and I'm gonna use those biases to, to bias whether it's gonna be a zero or a one. And so the, the, the actual outcome of the individual is biased by the couplings on the annealer. So that's kind of the, the classical uh, individual is the couplings on the annealer. The quantum value, so that's the thing I measure, is the zeros and ones. So we call it a, a classical genotype, which is the couplings, and the quantum genotype is what you measure. Uh, once you've got the quantum genotype, so that's the zeros and ones, you just you just work out the phenotype and the fitness and so on in the same way as before. So the only difference is we're putting this extra layer above it, whereas where the annealer is sitting. Right? So now this is this is a flowchart you can write for the thing where you you're including the annealer in everything. So you start here with a set of zero zeros and ones. So that's a population of uh, you know, quantum genotypes. This is all the same as before. So you work out the phenotypes, you work out the environment, the fitness. The important point here is that I, I don't have to change anything down here. 
Now, these are all the kind of computationally difficult things, like working out how many generations I've got and all this sort of thing, and then work out the fitness. And, and then uh, all the way up to here is the same. So now at this point, I define a set of biases. So that's a set of genotypes. I operate on those things the same way as before. So I choose breeding pairs. I have a crossover. I have a new set of these classical genotypes, which are couplings. And then my mutation is, is the annealing stage. So instead of having an official mutation, what I do is I have an annealing. I put, I put these classical genotypes, which are the couplings, into the quantum annealer. And that is my mutation in order to read off what the zeros and ones are of the population. So this is, uh, this is what we call genetic quantum annealing. So it's got the same sort of structure. Uh, and it's just trying to take advantage of the fact that on a quantum annealer, uh, you have this sort of possibility of quantum tunneling. All right, so you have this structure. Something else that you can do, of course, is you can couple them together. So you have a, pop, uh, a population where we can take, say, the fittest individual and we can couple it through its J couplings to the other individuals in the population as well. So we also, we also include that. And we, so this is something we call polyandry. It's, uh, we ha you have these uh, this, well, particular words, which are all slightly sexual. Right, anyway, so polyandry is what we call that. Anyway, it does appear to give you some advantage if you do that. So, so, so let me show you what happens if I compare that to a genetic algorithm, and I am uh, going to start by solving taxicab numbers. So the taxicab number problem. So if you remember, it's uh, that I'm trying to find a, a set of numbers that solve, set of integers that solve x1 to the k blah, 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 plus xm to the k is equal to y1 to the k plus yn to the k. So taxicab 366. Uh, so the genetic algorithm genetic algorithm you see sort of has this kind of smooth saturation curve as we go along. The quantum genetic quantum annealing does this sort of thing. And you may, you may think, all right, okay, this, this lumpiness means that you've not run it for long enough. So run it more until it goes smooth. But actually this, this is sort of reducible, it's reproducible. So that if I, this is after many runs, it always behaves the same way. But somehow it, it saturates first and then it somehow has another leap and another leap. And so it, it is getting to the solutions faster, but it does it with these sort of these leaps. And so, so similar thing happens here, taxi cab 377. And I, I didn't, we didn't actually believe this behavior was, you know, we thought there was something wrong with it, but it is actually operating in a different way from a normal genetic algorithm with these sorts of, Leap. So somehow the information is there in the in these couplings. We, we again we don't really know how it's encoded there, but it it always gets encoded there in the same way before it manages to do one of these leaps. Right, and then this is comparison for line bundle models with uh, on this particular collab. Yeah, so again you see, you do get some advantage, and then here I'm comparing generation numbers with uh, the the log of the best fitness. Again, we, we kind of run across this problem, which I mentioned before, is that when we have to access the quantum manila, you have a, a, a physical delay, a second delay. So we can't do anything like look at 10 to the 10 models, unfortunately. So the best we can do is look at how the fitness improves at the beginning, which is what I'm showing you here. So there is, any, but there is some evidence that it does operate in a slightly more efficient way. Right, okay, so I'm gonna leave it there. So let me just conclude the whole thing. So, so hopefully <laughs> I've given you some idea about, uh, about well, both meta heuristics, so genetic algorithms and uh, the more heuristic sorts of approaches like simulators annealing. And one thing that I actually didn't mention, but actually it came up in questions a little bit is um, you can, the things I showed you, we probably could have worked harder to optimize them. So we could have tried to use something like um, reinforcement learning to optimize our genetic algorithm and so you know there's probably still work to be done about you know getting the best uh, performance out of these things um one thing that we do find i mean the general thing which is probably true of heuristics versus meta heuristics is that when i'm think thinking about simulated annealing 
my, it's, it's a harder task to encode the thing I'm looking for onto a simulated annealer versus a genetic algorithm where it's much more like uh, reinforcement learning, a genetic algorithm in that you know, the, the environment is something which is kind of separate from the thing that's operating, which in, in it, reinforcement learning is a neural network here, it's a population, but that's kind of separated from the actual thing I'm interested in. So in that sense, they're both kind of operating in a similar way. I compared genetic algorithms to reinforcement learning is probably the closest thing to it. Um, and something which I just mentioned, well, I, I emphasize combining approaches, which I think more could be done with that. I didn't really talk much about adiabatic quantum computing, but I, I think maybe because gate quantum computers are going to improve quite soon, apparently, uh, that's something to sort of bear in mind instead of quantum annealing is adiabatic quantum computing. Right, okay, thanks, I'll leave it there. Um, in that case, I have a question. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> um, um, so um, I was wondering, you were talking about the leaping behavior in. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you have any sort of like intuition on why that happens? Is it some sort of phase transition maybe? Oh yeah, I mean, so it could be something like that. It does, it does kind of appear, to, it does look as if it's operating a bit like a phase transition, but um, yeah, so we don't know is, is, is the short answer why it's doing that. So we, yeah, we, we, we just need to do more work on it. If there are no further questions, I'd like to thank Steve again. Thank you. It's, it's photo time. I think we're supposed to go outside. Not outside, uh, in the big box fire, in the, you go in the reception area, and then through the glass doors, in the nice building, in the nice new building.